Now, what I want to cover with you now is how you can, in your social capital, discern how to choose people from which you get financial and business advice. Because there are places to go and places not to go. So, <clears throat> one of the basic principles <clears throat> is a prosperity principle of seek advice only from those qualified to give it. And I've always uh, found this interesting. Advice is judged by results, not by intentions. And I find it interesting that in the world of financial matters in particular, there's some kind of mechanism where we tend to go ask advice from people who know less about it than we do. I just have noticed that. Um, you know, uh, especially when the stock market gets really high, you know, you have the brother-in-law talking about stock advice, and you start asking people in the gym about what they're investing in. And I mean, this actually happens. I get asked all the time. Um, and uh, we tend to go to the, to the wrong professionals for the wrong services. And I'm going to explain why that is and, and what my observations. So what I created here was the Ecologics Guide to Types of Financial Advisors. It would, it's amazing to me that I had to create a chart so big to explain all of the different financial advisors that are out there. But basically, if you look at the left side, you will notice that there are all kinds of people who render financial or economic advice. Okay, the bottom is the author, the guru. How many authors or gurus do you know? Susie Orman, Dave Ramsey, David Bach, Jane Bryant Quinn, and on and on and on. Robert Kiyosaki from Rich Dad Poor Dad. <laughs> then you have attorneys. Attorneys will specialize in certain things, tax issues or litigation, estate planning. Business matters. They have something called an enrolled agent. Now, what does an enrolled agent do? Enrolled agent is enrolled by the IRS to be able to represent a taxpayer in front of the IRS. Enrolled agents, if you ever see EA after someone's name, they're an enrolled agent, which means that they do tax returns or handle tax problems. A banker, what does a banker do? Banking. Lending and, and uh, saving products. Okay, accountant. What do accountants do? Tax preparation. Some do tax planning. And they do accounting for business. How much you make, how much you spent. Here are the numbers. Insurance agents, what do they do? Sell insurance products, which are needful. Insurance protects from, from losses that, that would break you if, if it happened to you, right? Registered representative, what's that? A person who's licensed to sell investment products. Mutual funds, stocks, bonds, things like that. Then you have what's called a registered investment advisor. Registered investment advisor is one who advises for a fee on investment portfolios and does financial planning. Now, those are the specialties. Now, one thing I want to make sure that we're clear on is what the apparent intended result is of these professionals. Because when you go to somebody, you as a consumer have the right to expect to get a product, the, the intended result, that they can give you. What I find, however, is we as consumers oftentimes get upset with financial advisors because we expect something from them that they cannot give us. Let me give you a couple of examples. Okay. Um, Let's take the accountant. Now, how needful are accountants? Extremely needful. And they, do they not have the first position of trust for you? Of course they do. Why is that? Because they make sense of all the columns of numbers that are attendant to your business that you don't care about because you're in the profession you're in. But they keep you out of trouble and they keep you profitable, and they make sure that no, the IRS agents don't come knocking on your door. So they're very needful. So what is the apparent intended result of an accountant? Well, if they're involved in accounting, doesn't it make sense that they have perfectly balanced and correct financial records for your business? That is something you can expect from an accountant. Do you agree? Good, I would. How about tax preparation? 
a filed tax return compliant with the Internal Revenue Code. Now, that's different than a tax return that is designed to, let, to have you pay the lowest amount of tax possible. Ah. Have you ever had the complaint, my accountant doesn't really save me a lot in taxes? You ever had that thought at any time with your accountant? You don't have to admit it. I can see it in your face. <laughs> Why? Because we're expecting them to do something they do not do. The accountant must do a return in compliance with the tax code. Whether or not you, pay, you save or spend money in taxes is not his primary concern. He's got he's to be able to back up what numbers he put in those boxes. Do you see? That's not his job. It's, an, it's a compliant return. Now, if he's involved in tax planning, which the minority of accountants are in my experience, they may mitigate future tax liabilities. In other words, they may have you start expensing your money in a certain way or setting up di different business um, entities to help save future taxes. If you have an accountant that does that, keep him or her. That's rare. Most accountants, what do accountants do? They reconcile what you did in the past. The past. If you're looking for financial planning advice or answers, does it make sense to go to the accountant? No. You're expecting from him or her something they cannot do. Their attention is what happened before. Planning is what will happen in the future. It's a completely different view. But yet, are we run into consistently where, well, I need to run this by my accountant. Why? Because I trust him. Well, okay, good. But that's not what he does. He reconciles what you did in the past. Okay? And, and, and to get their opinion on insurance or investments is expecting something of them for that, that they're not prepared to do. That's on both sides. From them and from the consumer trying to expect that result from them. Do you see what I mean? I get asked all kinds of times about advice for which I'm not prepared to give. Do you see? And I stick to my knitting. So that's why we work with accountants, because they are very needful in the whole process. Very, very needful. Okay? How about um, one more point here I want to clarify with you is um, at the top of the, the, the graph, the parent intended result. Now, financial advisors come in many different shapes and sizes. Just because someone says, I'm a financial planner, I'm sure you probably realize right now that they probably have a bias. They say I'm a financial planner because that's a great marketing term because everybody innately knows they need to plan for their financial future. But I have come across, I know thousands of financial advisors. And what I've found is people say, I'm a financial planner. What do you do? I manage investment portfolios. They're not a financial planner. You're an investment portfolio manager. But the public doesn't know what that is, so they say financial planner. You see what I mean? Okay? So, that's, so a person who, if you go to somebody and say, I'm going to manage your portfolio, who's his client? Your account. Your portfolio. Not you. Big misunderstanding about the public, okay? They're managing the account, not the household. Very different product for a very different client. And, of course, a very different result, which we'll get into, okay? So there's one more point that I want to clarify here, and it's under standard of care. Standard of care in the financial world is, is of two basic flavors. There's one called suitability and one called fiduciary. Suitability is simply, is the recommendation made for you in the investment or insurance area suitable for you? In other words, is it going to assist you in the accomplishment of what you say your goals are? Not unsuitable. That's what that means. Insurance agents and registered representatives are under that standard of care. Compare that to a registered investment advisor who has a different kind of license who, who must operate under what's called a fiduciary responsibility. Fiduciary means doing what is in the best interest of the client. 
That's what it means. We're going to go over this a little bit more after lunch. But doing what's in the best interest of the client. Now, what does that really mean? Doing what's in the best interest of the client can be defined in many different ways, couldn't it? It actually derived from the Investment Company Act, where a person must manage the money for someone else in their best interest, not in the manager's best interest. That's where it came from. But when we define fiduciary, what is in your best interest for your household? Okay, it could be the optimum financial condition, or could it be a thousand other different things? But no matter what, would you want an advisor that's going to recommend things for you that are suitable, or that are, are specifically for your best interest? Which would you want? Second one? First one. Second one? Good. Fiduciary, right? I tell you what, being in this business for as long as I've been in, in it, I would never want to um, solely have my financial experience based on a, um, buying a product or service that was suitable for me. I want someone looking out for my best interest based on their knowledge of all these things I don't really understand. That's for me. Okay, and I mentioned as a professional, you might want to have the same experience. So I also want to include here what's called the scale of financial advice. Remember the scales again? Okay. If you want optimum results, in my view, using Econologics as a system, we'll realize there's a standard of advice, and the advice creates the greatest positive effect across all nine elements of a comprehensive financial plan toward attainment of a well-defined optimum financial condition. And you're going to see the de definition of the optimum financial condition in each of the nine elements as we go through. Okay? Now, how many of you would like to know that the, when you can see it, the advice you're getting is in alignment with the greatest results across all nine of the elements we, re we, we, we talked about? Does that make sense to you? Okay, good. Because if you want inadequate results, which is what is quote-unquote normal, here's what happens. The financial advice relates to one or more elements without regard to all nine. Okay? And no reference is made to an optimum financial condition for a household at all. There's no, there's no um, perfect operating condition being conceived of. And here's what happens in the world of financial ad ad advice. You buy a life insurance policy. The guy says it's the best. Okay, it's the best. You go down through life for a few years. Eh, it's not quite doing what we thought it was going to do. Okay, good. So you go to someone else. Well, that's not good. This is better. Okay? You ever had that experience? Yeah. Of course. Okay, good. So what happened here? They took the advice that they gave was only in the asset protection area. It did not take into consideration all the other eight elements. So was it the best transaction for you to do? Maybe, maybe not. All I can tell you is, is that when we look at it from only that my, uh, myopic perspective, we end up losing the big picture. And, and fi your financial experience is a big picture thing. So when you get advice from someone, make sure that you are looking at it from your whole entire financial experience, not just the fact that this fund is doing better than that one. There's where you'll make mistakes, big ones. And th that's what the average person does. Okay? And of course, that's why we have inadequate results. Finally, financial advice creates the greatest negative effect across all nine elements. Comprehensive financial plan, no concept of any optimum financial condition. These are catastrophic results. Okay? This is the fraudster. This is the... This is the, um, uh, my favorite one, the oil well in Belize. I don't make this up. Guy came to my office and I, he's got an oil well in Belize. I went ahead and invested in it. Where's that, where that in your financial plan? Is that money there? No, it's gone. If you, if you haven't paid attention, realize that there are some people out there in the financial industry or even perceptibly in the financial industry that may not have your best interest in mind. <laughs> Just know that that might be a possibility. Okay? And all I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to proof you up so that when you choose an advisor, whoever it is, that you're looking at it from, is this relationship going to help me achieve my goals? So one more thing I want to clarify here with you. Um, in my chapter in the book, Successonomics, with, uh, with Steve Forbes, I wrote a, a, small, a short chapter on how to choose a financial advisor, an ideal financial advisor. Now, this is based <clears throat> on, uh, and there's actually an interview worksheet you can download. It's actually in your, in your course pack. But uh, let's take a look here at how do I find an ideal financial advisor. Now, what I did here as a, as a 
kind of a selfish plug, is I put what the econologic system would do as an answer to these questions so you can compare. First of all, what do you want in an ideal advisor as part of your social capital, your social circle? So the first part of this questionnaire is for you to, to answer these questions for yourself, right? Then go and interview a financial professional and ask them these questions. And then compare their answers to what you want. That's all I'm saying, okay? And uh, again, it's, to, it's to, to find that partner for you that you are going to trust and most importantly, follow their advice. There's no reason to hire a financial professional and not follow their advice. That's the wrong relationship. Okay? They must, you must agree with you philosophy, your philosophy, and you must have a certain feeling with them. So let's go cover these questions real quickly. First question, are you acting as a fiduciary? That's the first question, right? If the answer is no, then you, you know right away. And how, how do you define fiduciary standard? Because everybody has their own definition of what's in your best interest compared to their licensure, compared to their experience, certifications, and so on. Number two, what objective result can I expect to experience once I receive your service? What objective result? Okay. Number three, how do you objectively measure the results of your services? Not subjectively, objectively. See, people choose a financial advisor. Well, I like them. Okay? There's a lot of people I like that I wouldn't have guide me. Do you see? Or, well, he did a great job for my friend down the street. Good. Does that mean he's going to do a great job for you? Maybe, maybe not. Okay? So you should be able to objectively measure. Number four, do you have a written financial plan for your household? Ha, 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 ha. What a question, huh? Okay, because I would think that you would probably want a financial planner who, has, who believes enough in financial planning to have his own plan. Okay, and if so, can I see the, the binder? Because he has his own financial plan. Okay? Do you specialize in the types of clients unique to my industry or profession? That's critical. Why do you think that is? If you have a financial advisor who specializes with military families, and you're a private practice dentist, do, are you going to get, expect to get advice that's going to help you achieve the go goals you have in your private practice experience? Right? And we all specialized. All financial advisors will specialize with somebody. We, we find a particular bias or niche that we, we get, and you're going to find that there are people out there that have the same, uh, have experience that's going to help you in your unique situation. Do you own the same or very similar investment and insurance services that you are recommending to me? Critical question. All right? Because now you know the difference between a person who is a financial planner, who is implementing their own plan, who, who believes in what, they, what they're recommending to you, or you have a person who's a salesperson. Okay? And if, if they are an independent financial advisor, private practice professional, guess what? They probably should have the same stuff that's recommended to you because they're in the similar type of experience you're having. Okay? And finally, what services do you provide to educate me on financial and economic matters so I can have a more successful financial experience? Because every financial advisor should be able to communicate financial concepts to you in a way you really understand so you can partner with that person rather than being in a position where you're affected by, by their knowledge. Okay? And one more thing I'm going to comment here. You should never be in a position where you feel that, that um, they're being authoritarian, author, authoritarian, okay, or speaking or being condescending in any way. If they're not speaking a language you don't understand, you have every right to say, stop, and put that in English. Because, they, because people will, we, we, when we, you get around your technical people, you start talking all about this stuff that I don't understand, okay, but I say, what does that mean? You put it in simple English, I understand. I'm like, oh, I get that, okay, you know? So, uh, same thing with financial and economic matters, so, uh, accounting matters. We talk to each other, we use jargon all the time, but you are a lay person, if we use a word you don't understand, stop. What does that mean? Because there's a simple explanation for every big word. Okay? Now, once you have all that in place, then once you do your interview with whatever advisor that you're looking at, you need to ask yourself four questions. Number one, can I trust this advisor to act in my best interest based on his, his definition of fiduciary responsibility? 
Okay? If you feel that you have that level of trust with that person, answer yes. If not, no. Again, if it doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't make sense, right? Number two, do I agree with his financial planning philosophy and system enough to follow through with his recommendations? Again, if you're not going to follow their advice, don't hire them. Don't waste your money. Okay? Number three, do I feel confident that he understands my unique needs, such as my personal goals, my business challenges, and the type of financial experience I want? That's important. Okay? And number four, do I really believe that he has the knowledge, resources, and competence to actually help me and my family achieve my, our financial objectives? If you cannot answer yes to all four, keep looking, okay? Because there is someone out there that can assist you in what it is that you want to achieve and what kind of experience you want to have with a financial advisor.